So the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War, is at an end. The terms for the end of this conflict actually were what set the stage for revolution. This is generally what happens. Uh, if we look at history, we find that there's generally revolt, rebellion, whatever, upheaval, conflict, every you know 20 to 40 years. Um, but generally on the 20 years terms, it's because of how the previous war ended that slowly built up the frustration, the animosity, the tension, and it spills over into a new conflict. The cause of World War II came from events from the ending of World War I. Um, so in terms of the revolution in America, what led to it? Well, for starters, the Treaty of Paris ended the Seven Years' War, and one of the terms of that was the Proclamation Line. It set the boundary along the Appalachian Mountains that told colonists, all right, we got, we got the French out. This is your land now. You're nice and safe, but don't cross this line. West of the Appalachian, that is supposed to be reserved for uh, the indigenous Americans. Of course, they didn't refer to them as tactfully as that, but in today's term, in today's terms and trying to be respectful of this culture, you do want to refer to them as Native Americans, uh, American Indians, or indigenous Americans. All of that is capitalized because that is the name of their, their group. So just, uh, if you do happen to refer to them in writing, please refer to them in respectful terms. We don't call them Indians. That is old school. Plus, somebody who is an Indian is somebody who is from India. People from the Americas are Native Americans, Indigenous Americans, or the American Indians. Um, but back to this. So we have the proclamation line, and it's the boundary. Well, the colonists are thinking, what? We are here to grow, to expand, to prosper, and now you're telling us that we're not allowed to go into this land of prosperity? There was a lot of resentment and, and fear and anxiety. I mean, the, the colonies were starting to get uh, a little more crowded, and also up in the New England area, so in the, the northern colonies, the land there was not good for farming. It was sandy. It wasn't fertile. And so if you were a farmer, you, you're not very successful. And most of the farming land down in the south had already been claimed by larger, wealthier landowners um, and citizens. And so uh, the, the poor people, the, the everyday Joe, is looking for a way to make their mark, make, get their land and their wealth. And so by being told that they couldn't be there, there was some resentment. Plus, the people who were already west of that proclamation line were told, all right, you need to go back within the boundaries of the British colonies. And people didn't like that, did not like that, that control um, and feared where that might lead to. So that was one thing. The other is the British just got done fighting a long war. Wars are expensive. You need to pay soldiers, you need to feed them, house them, all of the ammunitions and what goes with that. So the British were actually had their treasury depleted and they felt since they were fighting to defend the colonists, uh, the colonists should help pay back that debt. And the colonists weren't against that. They realized, okay, the, you did your part, we'll, we'll help you pay it back. But the method of taxation was what they had an issue with. Um, it started off with just little taxes, and then those taxes grew and grew, and then the number of things that were taxed grew. And so it seemed like everywhere they went, they couldn't escape this, this choking reminder of taxation. And one of the things is also related to this heavy-handedness is the British told the colonists, we're your trading partner." You are our colony, so if you want some manufactured, some, some European goods, you get them from us. You trade with our merchants. You don't get to go see if the Dutch can offer you a better deal. You go with us. And so then all of the taxes that you pay on the goods that you purchase go to our treasury. Now, because of that, 
the, the, the British had a monopoly on trade. And so the thing with monopolies are you can set whatever price you want because there's no competition. If people want the items, they have to pay your prices. And the colonists thought that that was really unfair. So it actually led to some smuggling uh, where they would find French and Dutch resources for the things that they needed. And the French were all for that because they had just gotten defeated by the British. The British were their number one enemies. And any way that they can kind of thumb their noses at the British, they were all for. So, um, so this heavy-handedness limited trade and the, the only people that uh, the colonists saw as benefiting from all of this trade was the British. So the colonists were like, what? What's in it for us? So it actually led to women being very influential during the revolution because if you, one of the things that the, the colonists did is they started boycotting, which means they, they cut off. They said, we're not participating in trade with you. If we're only allowed to buy your goods, we just won't buy your goods, we'll make our own. And so if you need clothing, you need candles, you need all of these different household goods, you gotta have somebody make them. Women learned to make things. Women learned how to meet the needs of their households uh, and control the purchasing of things. And so women were actually very influential and then they turned more in towards the home to provide for the supplies that they needed so they didn't have to go and buy British goods. Uh, and again, the women were the, the purchasers. They got their money from their husbands, but they were the ones actually going out and buying the items. So if uh, they're being required to buy British items and they say, no, the women are actually influencing and hurting the, the British economy or uh, the British trade. So that was like, yay. Um, so the, the other thing, oh, so there are still British soldiers in the colonies. Well, the war is over. And there are still soldier, soldiers there, and the British government says, ugh, we just spent all of this money and time feeding and housing these soldiers. We're putting it on you, colonists, to take care of our soldiers. So it was called the Quartering Act. And this told the colonists that you are responsible for housing and feeding and, and supplying the needs of a soldier who is assigned to your home. So now colonists, have like the British government, the military in their own homes, observing them. They're having to take away from their own to feed and supply whatever this guy needs. And he's gonna have some arrogance because he's a British soldier and these are lowly, you know, colonists and all of this. And they are they should be holding to the British government because they just got them out of a war and got the the nasty French out and all of that stuff. And so the colonists thought, well, that's really unfair. Um, so that kind of ad added to this heavy handed tactics and this, um, this unfairness. And it was the unfairness that the colonists were rebelling against. They didn't, they didn't again argue that they needed to contribute to the taxation, uh, the reparations of debt for the British government because of what they had done. Um, and, but there was just, there was just no say. Colonists in the Americas saw themselves as British. They were British subjects. They understood that King George III over in Great Britain was their sovereign. He was their leader. But when colonists, when people started leaving Europe and settling in North America on behalf of a European country, what they created between the colonists, the settlers, and the government was something called a charter. And this charter is basically a contract between these two parties. The, the European government says, yes, we agree, we support you in your claims, your settlement overseas, we are there to support you, uh, be there to protect you, um, and in terms of that, then you agree to be a, a dedicated citizen to our country, work on its behalf, uh, work on trading goods that benefit the homeland, and all of that. It was supposed to be a mutually beneficial agreement. 
And this charter also states the rules of this new land or this new settlement. And so usually within the charter, the agreement was, we trust you. We trust the government that you're going to establish on our behalf and you can kind of run yourselves. You can come up with laws. Now, the laws that they come up with did need to get sent back over to England for approval, but they at least got to come up with their own laws um, and have some say in what was necessary for their people, for the people living in those settlements, and that was good. Well, that sounds fair, but then what happened was the British government, so the king and parliament, started making laws like the proclamation line, like the excessive taxation. And they made all of these laws for this other country, or not this other country, but for this other group of people. But those people didn't have any say. It's not like Parliament came up with these things and then went to the colonists and said, okay, do you approve these? How do you feel about these? Let's get some input and some say so. No, the, the government over in Britain was it was concrete it was flat there was no negotiation there was no discussion it was our rule our say is law and you have to deal with it but as far as the colonists go your say is a recommendation then you come to us you come to britain and parliament and we'll say whether you're okay or not with that law and it was considered bunk by the colonists that's the issue that they had and the confusion because this charter says okay colonists we trust you to be able to govern yourself you come up with things you bring it to us we'll double check it make sure it's okay it's not going to conflict with some other rules and stuff that we have um, but you do your thing and then they later find out no that's not actually how that that charter is not being respected by the other party um, and Ben Franklin was actually the, the negotiator or the, um, the emissary um, ambassador over in Great Britain. And he was very pro-British. Like he was, I am a British subject. I believe in their authority and all of that. But then when these different terms are coming out, he's, he's a little, con he's, well, he's very confused and a bit offended, like, but I thought this was the agreement that we had, and it, it wasn't. And so these types of things were what led to the revolution. And even when the first shots were fired in Lexington and Concord in 1775, everybody was stunned, like it wasn't a foregone conclusion. The rebellions that had been happened, the skirmishes, the, the Boston Tea Party, all of those things were not acts of trying to separate from the British government. Most people wanted to stay citizens of Britain. It was an outcry for injustice and trying to bring awareness to that to make some change, make things more fair. It was not intended to lead to a separation and the creation and formation of a whole new country. And so there, <laughs> for starters, the British were the number one power in the world. So, so these little colonists had no thought of ever being able to beat and conquer this superior force. And if it weren't for the fact that the British also had a lot of enemies who then became the colonists' friends during the revolution, the colonists would not have been able to defeat the British, and then we would maybe actually all be speaking with the British accent. Who knows? Um, but but these are the things. It wasn't just a matter of no taxation without representation. It was this idea that that things that had been established were not being honored and respected, and that the colonists weren't even being treated as responsible thoughtful British subjects, they were, they were afraid of turning into to slaves to Britain, which is kind of funny in a, 
in uh, ironic ways, the fact that these white colonists were afraid of being slaves, and guess what they had? They had slaves. They knew how much it's, how terrible it was, I'm trying to be tactful here. Uh, and so they saw the oppression and the lack of recognition of basic human rights that they inflicted on other people. Well, they didn't want this European power treating them in that exact same manner because they understood the imbalance and the just the unfairness, the lack of a voice, the lack of representation, respect, dignities, and all of that. And so that's what they were, were fighting against. So this leads us into the creation or the, or the revolution itself. And then you want to look at some of the American revolutionary heroes and people who maybe aren't the more known heroes like George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Marquis de Lafayette, and people like that. So it, it wasn't just the big guys who won it. There were a lot of lesser known people who, who made an impact. And that's kind of one of the important things about understanding about history is the history that we're taught today is generally written by a select elite few, the records that are left behind. But there's so much more to that, and so we don't get a true look at all of the influential people of all different the men, women, young, old, white, African American, or uh, African descent, um, indigenous, all of those people that went towards shaping our country. And we want to make sure that they are recognized for their role in independence and the evolution of our country.